Um, I want to thank um, Michael Della Carpini of the Annenberg School for um, being our gracious host this evening. I want to thank Erica Kitzmiller uh, for doing a lot of logistical work uh, to bring us here. And uh, I also want to thank um, Deborah Williams of the Annenberg School who handled a lot of the important details. Um, this lecture is also being sponsored by the Annenberg School and by the History Department. Uh, so we have um, support from around the university as well as the Penn Program on Democracy, Constitutionalism, and Citizenship. Tonight's speaker, Rick Perlstein, is known to many of you as a best-selling author, a regular political commentator and blogger, and I would say a genuine public intellectual. He was educated at the University of Chicago and is a very proud graduate of that institution as well as the University of Michigan and he's now a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Over the last 10 years, Rick has established himself as um, arguably the most influential historian of modern American conservatism. His first book, Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater and the Unmaking of the American Consensus, won the 2001 Los Angeles Times Book Award and was on a whole series of best book of the year lists um, in 2001. Um, it's also one of the rare books in our polarized age uh, that won glowing reviews in publications on the left, the mainstream center, um, and on the political right. Rick is best known, I think, for his book, Nixonland, The Rise of a President and the Fracturing uh, of America, which was published in 2008. Nixonland was widely reviewed. It was uh, including on the front page of the New York Times uh, book review and very quickly became a bestseller. Nixonland focuses on the intense political struggles uh, of the 1960s and the ways that Richard Nixon turned conflict and polarization into effective political tools uh, for his and his party's uh, uh, aims, uh, and in the process remade both American politics and society. The nation's re reviewer of Nixon Land, a history professor at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, memorably described Pearlstein as the hyper-caffeinated Herodotus of the American century uh, for the book's extraordinary detail as well as its gripping prose. It's really a great read, and I say this as someone who has been teaching the history of, the Amer of America in the 1960s for the last 20 years. Pearlstein's uh, work has appeared just about everywhere. He was chief national political correspondent for the Village Voice. Uh, he was uh, a, a contributing editor to the great and short-lived Lingua Franca. Um, his essays have appeared in the New Republic, the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and he's currently a contributor to Rolling Stone, uh, which just published his fascinating piece on the relationship of uh, George and Mitt Romney, uh, well worth um, having a look at to get insight into um, perhaps the Republican Party's front runner. Uh, Pearlstein is continuing his study of the rise and development of the American right uh, by pushing forward into the 1970s in a book in progress, uh, which explores the rise of Ronald Reagan against the backdrop of 70s politics and culture. And that's going to be the subject of this evening's talk. The Invisible Bridge, the 1970s, and the Rise of Ronald Reagan. Thanks. Rick. Thanks, Tom. I'm very glad to be here, and I'm really glad of the nickname, the hypercaffeinated Herodotus of the American Century. Tom and I go back a little further than that. Uh, how I got involved in this accursed profession was um, when I wrote a uh, 1996 Lingua Franca article called Who Owns the 60s, the Opening of a Scholarly Generation Gap, in which I uh, reported on how writers about the 60s who were post-baby boomer were coming up with completely novel and different interpretations of the 60s. And one of those was the distinguished colleague uh, Tom Segru, who told me, you want to talk about black power, think about all those black mayors and city council members. Uh, and uh, so I'm very glad to be here under his auspices and under the auspices of uh, the departments and centers who are sponsoring me tonight. So yes, I'm in the middle of writing a big book uh, to be entitled The Invisible Bridge, the 1970s and the Rise of Ronald Reagan. Um, and uh, you can think about it most basically as a book about how Ronald Reagan became president uh, if the answer in the tiniest little nutshell is because of the 1970s. 
um, if the 1970s, if Reagan was the answer, what was the question? Uh, it begins with another little nutshell, an epigram of something Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, of all people, once, to once told Richard Nixon. He said, if the people believe there's an imaginary river out there, you don't tell them there's no river there. You build an imaginary bridge over the imaginary river. Perhaps the poetic resonances of that will become a little more clear by the end of this uh, lecture, or maybe I'll, I'll be able to figure it out by the time I get through the 800 page, writing the 800 page book. Uh, but first, another nutshell. This time, a longer one. It's the first four paragraphs of the book. Uh, and it seeks to set the table for understanding the 1970s by going back to the 1870s. Once upon a time, we had a civil war. Over 600,000 Americans slaughtered one another. Soon afterward, the two sides began carrying out sentimental rituals of reconciliation. Confederate soldiers, for instance, paraded through the streets of Boston to the cheers of welcoming Yankee throngs. John Quincy Adams II orating from the podium, you are come so that once more we may pledge ourselves to a new union, not a union merely of law or simply of the lips, not a union of the sword, but gentlemen, the only true union, the union of hearts. Dissenters from the new postbellum committee, like the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, who argued that the new system of agricultural labor taking root in the South and enforced by Ku Klux Klan terror hardly differed from slavery, were shouted down. The New York Times indignantly asked, does he really imagine that outside of small and suspicious circles, any real interest attaches to the old forms of the Southern question? Remember that phrase, small and suspicious circles. Meanwhile, Americans were disuniting themselves in fresh new ways. The nation expanded westward, violently. A radical new kind of industrialism shuddered across the nation, wrenching yeoman farmers from the land, forcing formerly independent artisans into degraded factory work, giving rise to robber baron fortunes, financial panics, wretched immigrant slums. 1877, the year Reconstruction ended, was a year of cataclysmic labor strikes, the most violent in American history. But that was also the era that founded patriotic societies like the Daughters of the American Revolution, introduced a sentimental cult of flag worship, and invented something called Americanism as the new litmus test for citizenship. Quote, the man who would foment strife between East or West, North or South, between labor and capital, or any section of our life is the universal enemy, a typical opinion leader proclaimed. Transcending strife, consensus, was declared the very meaning of our nation. America the innocent, always searching for totems of a unity it could never quite achieve. Even, or even especially, when its crises of disunity are most pressing. It is one of the structuring stories of our nation, whether the return to normalcy enjoined by Harding after the Great War, or the union of hearts declaimed by John Quincy Adams Jr. on Boston's Bunker Hill Parade Ground, or the insistent cult of domesticity that followed World War II. And in 1973, after some 10 years of war in Vietnam, America tried to do it again. The book next uh, describes the concerted attempt directed by the White House and the Pentagon to orchestrate a good old fashioned unifying ritual of patriotic renewal, just like after all the other wars. Uh, it's centered around the repatriation of Vietnam prisoners of war. And when I use the word directed, I mean that literally. Here's Richard Nixon speaking in the Oval Office to the Pentagon official in charge of what was christened Operation Homecoming. It's like a producer putting on a great play or a great movie. You have a hell of a bunch of stars in this one. It's an all-star cast, even the bit players. Elliot Richardson, Nixon's Secretary of Defense, put it this way. The returning POWs have dramatically launched what DOD is trying to do to restore the military to its proper position. Nixon responded, we now have an invaluable opportunity to revise the history of this war. I won't dwell but, uh, before such a learned audience on why it was the President and Pentagon were so eager to revise the history of the Vietnam War. That should be familiar enough to all of you. Instead, I'll narrate how the patriotic reverie kept in the 1970s getting rudely interrupted by the suspicious circles, which turned out to be no longer so small after all. Here was Mike Royko, the famous and beloved uh, 
columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times, a uh, kind of columnist that doesn't really exist today, the kind of beer-chugging, regular guy, liberal columnist, um, describing his feelings upon Nixon's announcement at the end of, the Janu end of January of the Paris Peace Accords. It wasn't like 1945 when the end of the war brought a million people downtown to cheer. Now the president comes on TV, reads his speech, and without a sound, the country sets the clock and goes to bed. There is nothing to cheer about this time, except that it is over. Why kid ourselves? They didn't die for anyone's freedom. They died because we made a mistake. And we can't justify it with slogans and phrases from other times. If we insist on looking for something of value in this war, then maybe it is this. Maybe we, have the, the, we, we finally have the painful knowledge that we can never again believe everything our leaders tell us. Now, it's interesting to, to read this, this month because we just apparently ended a war, uh, and I didn't read any columns uh, uh, talking about Haditha or the lessons we learned from Iraq. Um, the POW started coming home on February 12th. Another of those regular guy liberal columnists, Pete Hamill of the New York Post, promptly pointed out that most of the returnees were bomber pilots and that they were killing civilians in an undeclared war and thus were, quote, prisoners because they committed unlawful acts. He compared his feelings waiting for the POWs to arrive home to, quote, waiting for a guy up at Sing Sing one time who had done hard time for armed robbery. Strikingly, such sentiments turned out to be prevalent even within the military. Now, military personnel, especially low-level military personnel, are traditionally no-nonsense types, and the annals of military history is filled with examples of their suspicions of the politicians and officers who send them into the meat grinder. The difference, though, is that this has traditionally been an underground history. Now it was on the surface, thanks in part to the newspaper that was now the Suspicious Circle's house organ, and also happened to be the newspaper of record in the United States. Here is one of the New York Times' first dispatches from Operation Homecoming headquarters at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. Quote, Few military people here feel that the return of prisoners marked the end of the fighting. They're sending out as many as come back, said a young Air Force corporal who worked at the airport, works at the airport. They're all going to Thailand. They're just moving the boundaries of the war back. On February 23rd, the paper editorialized that in the succession of hand salutes, stiffly prepared statements, medical bulletins, and canned handouts concerning the joys of steak and ice cream, the hard-won lessons of Vietnam are in danger of being lost. Other outlets were less skeptical, at least at first. NBC News' Jack Perkins signed off a February 18 dispatch, the prisoners coming back seems finally to be the one thing about Vietnam that has made all Americans indisputably feel good. Newsweek gave over eight pages to images of celebration. The nation begins to feel itself whole again, they concluded. Times speculated about how these impressive men who had become symbols of America's sacrifice in Indochina might help the country heal the lingering wounds of war. Their readers, however, fought back from the grassroots. One Newsweek letter writer said it would take more than a Pentagon pinup picture to make her forget that these professional fighting men were trained in the calculated destruction of property and human life. A Time reader wrote, as an ex-grunt, I feel a certain churlish resentment about the solicitous, solicitous attention to the returning POWs. Why were we sneaked back into our society so our country can more easily forget the crimes we committed in its name? Again, that word crimes repeated over and over again. Those self-same organs and their editorial content soon could not even sustain the fiction of national unity. NBC rounded out its coverage of the first week of Operation Homecoming with a feature from the hospital bed of a Marine, paralyzed from the waist down, sad-eyed, fidgety, nervous, making the same complaint that he'd been snuck back into the country. And Time, in the middle of March, joined itself to the most devastating argument of the anti-war movement about Operation Homecoming, the fact that North Vietnam's treatment of the 576 released prisoners was nothing compared to the at least 27,000 prisoners still held by our v South Vietnamese allies in defiance of the Paris Peace Accords, many for mild expressions of political dissent in prisons that America had designed and built. Here's Time Magazine, which of course had been a kind of middle-of-the-road mainstream supporter of the Vietnam War. 
It is not even really proper to call them men anymore. Shapes is a better word. Years of being shackled in the tiger cages have forced them into a permanent pretzel-like crouch. They move like crabs, skittering across the floor on buttocks and palms. Things have been especially bad since the ceasefire. When told of the Paris settlement, the prisoners cheered, only to be stopped by doses of lie. We had hoped to begin the new year with happiness, said one, but my new year began when I was doused with excrement. It couldn't have been lost on Time's readers that the jailer being described here, uh, the jailers being described here were the very same supposedly freedom-loving government we had just spent 55,000 American lives and billions of dollars to defend. Now, if media discourse following any other American war had ever been as skeptical as this, I'm not aware of it. But this, to me, was the essence of America's 1970s, a time when suspicion and skepticism towards powerful institutions was mainstreamed as never before. Operation Homecoming coincided with the movement, with the movement when Watergate, uh, which uh, in 1972 came and went without making much of an appreciable impact on either American politics or American culture, began closing in on the White House. The Watergate trial had begun 10 days before the inauguration with hardly any press coverage, was limited in its indictments to the Watergate burglars and their immediate supervisors, G. Gordon Liddy, Howard Hunt, and James Accord. James McCord, with the prosecution not even hinting at higher up involvement in the Nixon White House or campaign. Then during sentencing in March, Judge John J. Sirica read an extraordinary letter from James McCord, who had been the Nixon campaign's chief of security, alleging political pressure applied to the defendants to plead guilty and remain silent, hinting that it came from very high up, and adding, several members of my family have expressed fear for my life if I disclose knowledge of this matter either publicly or to any government representatives. The opening of the televised Watergate hearings two months later set the pattern for the next 15 months. Every week, sometimes every day, mind-blowing new revelations about high government officials behaving like mafiosi. Most importantly, the dynamic of each new revelation pointed in only one direction, upward. Until, inexorably, the President of the United States' implication in some of the most serious crimes in the statute's book, statute book became all but undeniable. What else happened over the years 1973 to 1974? Simultaneously, the shocking revelation that American abundance itself might be coming to an end. Uh, the winter of Nixon's inauguration, Des Moines homeowners almost ran out of heating oil, and Denver high schools uh, went on three-day weeks to conserve fuel. In spring, Energy Star factories closed in West Virginia, Illinois, Mississippi. As Memorial Day approached, rumors spread about fuel rationing at gas stations. In June, 2,000 independent service stations shut down, turning street corners into ghost towns. Thousands of others began imposing 10-gallon limits per purchase. Utility officials in San Antonio cut gas allotments by 67%. And this, the 11th largest city in the nation, nearly went dark but for a mercy mission of loaned out-of-state fuel trucks. And all this was before the Arab oil embargo of October 1973, when President Nixon went on TV to pronounce a very stark fact. We are heading into the most acute energy shortage since World War II. Uh, it had a profound impact on the culture. Uh, let me read from a chapter uh, that I'm going to be calling in the book, The Year Without Christmas Lights. Uh, the idea had been pioneered by no less Norman Rockwell an institution than Sears Roebuck. Already custodians downtown in Sears' hometown of Chicago were cleaning offices by flashlight. The Public Safety Committee of the Milwaukee Common Council held an evening meeting by candlelight. New York banned the illumination of outdoor advertising after 9.30 p.m., so why not suspend energy-wasting Christmas illumination? It seemed the patriotic thing to do. A Los Angeles Times reader proposed a moratorium on energy-wasting Christmas cards. Others debated whether the eternal flame that burned at the gravesite of President Kennedy at Arlington National Cemetery, wasting 2,200 cubic feet of natural gas a month, ought to be doused. Wouldn't it seem logical to use that gas for a better use, such as heating homes or office buildings, rather than just burning for no real purpose, whatever? 
in a Texas town that banned Christmas lights, a child researched how to say peace on earth in uh, many languages and taped it up with a big peace symbol in the middle of a plywood sheet. She was in better spirits than the flaxen-haired boy who looked like the boogeyman had just stolen his teddy bear that Time Magazine put on their cover for an article entitled A Child's Christmas in America, which began with the following vignettes. In St. Louis, 10-year-old suit up for karate, cab, karate <coughs> class. Going to teach him not to rip me off, murmurs a disciple. Just like in a clockwork orange. <laughs> in Brooklyn, a boy scarcely old enough to go to school composes a graffito with a spray can against the handball court, the word Nixon, with the X in the form of a swastika. In Anaheim, California, a group of preschoolers ponder the wonders of Disneyland. I'm not going to live here when I grow up, uh, one, one of them uh, vows. I'm going to live there when I grow up, one of them vows. Why? Not a pollution anywhere. So there's the 70s. Feel free to share your own vignettes later. Uh, but let's talk about the, the political consequences of this new culture of dread. One was an overwhelming paranoia that the energy crisis was caused by outright conspiracy of the powerful. And it wasn't just crazy people with sandwich boards saying so. It was senators. In June, Adlai Stevenson III thundered that the administration was acting in concert with the major companies to produce a shortage. In December, Senator Henry Scoop Jackson, uh, who for his hawkish defense policies became a hero of, new, hero of neoconservatives who didn't notice he was one of the most scouring critics of big business in either House of Congress, said the White House knew the crisis was coming but deliberately did nothing about it, quote, uh, because for the major oil companies, the shortages were good business. It was uh, this overwhelming mood of inst anti-institutional fervor that sent a new generation of young Democrats to Congress in 1974, many of them from traditional Republican districts. Uh, once in panel, they got straight away to work fulfilling their mandate to begin, search, uh, begin a searching reconstruction of just about every corrupt American institution, or at least what they read as their manda mandate, uh, even and most especially the defense establishment. Of course, on December 22, 1974, the New York Times ran a famous front page article by Seymour Hersh detailing what the CIA called its family jewels, its secret records of assassinations of foreign leaders, coups against foreign governments, and spying on US citizens. A year of investigations followed. Hearings in the Senate led by Idaho's Frank Church and the House by uh, New York's Otis Pike repeated the Watergate investigatory pattern, which was now becoming routine. Eye-popping revelations undreamt of before by American citizens who had imagined their nations as innocent. Now, for the purposes of my presentation today, I think the most interesting detail of the church committee hearings um, uh, was not something like the fact that it showed that the, the CIA had developed poison blowgun darts or it tried to um, uh, poison uh, Fidel Castro so that his beard fell out, um, but the facts of the investigations on Frank Church's political career. He had just spent the year rubbing in the American people's faces the fact that their nation was the world's outstanding international lawbreaker. So what to do but run for president? <laughs> in today's context, that sounds crazy, but in 1976, it made sense. And indeed, Church won primaries in heartland states, including Montana, Nebraska, and his own native Idaho, in a terrible, disorganized campaign. But for a brief moment, Frank Church seemed to embody this political spirit of the age. In fact, more or less, what the Democratic candidates for the 1976 nomination did was run around the country time, trying to convince the American people that they were the best spokesman for the proposition that American institutions were thoroughly rotten. One of them, of course, won the presidency via the formulation, the American people deserve a government as good as its people, and I will not lie to you. But even if Jimmy Carter won the election, he did not win the age. So now's the time to introduce the hero of our story, who was another unlikely entrant into the 1976 presidential race, Ronald Wilson Reagan. Here's the most important political point you can make about Ronald Reagan in 1973 and 1974. He really looked like a loser. And for a 
pretty specific reason that um, I don't think anyone's, uh, any historian has talked about yet. Uh, on April 30th, 1973, Watergate got so bad that Nixon gave his first televised speech denying involvement. Uh, he promised a full and complete investigation. Uh, there followed in the wake of this address a new consensus, even among the president's staunchest defenders. This scandal was the most serious thing in American politics, perhaps in American political history. A consensus that is encompassing everyone in public life, but it seemed Ronald Reagan. He said Watergate was just part of the, quote, usual atmosphere of campaigning and added, the tragedy of this is that men who are not criminals at heart and certainly would not commit criminal or illegal acts must bear the consequences. It soon became the one thing most Americans knew about Ronald Reagan as a political figure. He was the guy who thought the Watergate conspirators were not criminals at heart. Time ran a digest about which prospects to replace Nixon in 1976 were up and which were down. And for that remark alone, Ronald Reagan was judged the lowest of them all. For months, he honored his political handler's strenuous advice to shut up about Watergate. Then in June, he put his foot in his mouth again, supposedly, telling reporters, I just think it's too bad that it has taken people's attention from what I think is the most brilliant accomplishment of any president in this century. When John Dean testified before the Senate committee and set the political world in its ear by revealing the existence of a White House enemies list, Reagan, practically alone among politicians, dismissed it. Uh, saying, in the political lexicon, the term enemies does not have the same connotation as the layperson would use. The news came out that Vice President Spiro Agnew was being investigated for taking bribes. Republicans rushed to distance themselves. Ronald Reagan was once again glad to buck the tide. I have known Ted Agnew to be an honest and honorable man, he said immediately. He was one of the good guys. In August, he called the Watergate Committee investigation a lynching and a, wet, uh, a witch hunt. He said so even though the Washington Post had just reported that the White House had been spying on Reagan himself and had been working on blackmailing him using some unspecified activities at a party. Reagan's response to the Post was a uh, trademark, a non sequitur quip, uh, delivered with such glib confidence it left his interlocutors confused about what the question they had just asked in the first place was. I don't know what they're referring to, he told the Post. You've really caught me with mixed emotions because I don't know whether to get a sort of glint in my eye and let you think there's a side of me that nobody knows. The Post followed up, pointing out the existence of the White House taping system. Didn't it offend him a little bit that his Oval Office meetings had been taped? No big deal, he responded. Quote, matter of fact, they probably make me look good. <laughs> they didn't, by the way. Um, you can go on YouTube and hear um, Nixon say, with a Reagan in here, you could damn well almost get yourself in a nuclear war. <laughs> Although, to be fair, uh, during the Yom Kippur War, Reagan was one of the first people that Henry Kissinger consulted. Uh, Reagan used his ability to kind of see the big picture to come up with a very interesting uh, strategic solution. Anyway, uh, he kept it going right up to the eve of Nixon's resignation in 1974, and even afterwards he said, well, good, now we can find out, we can really get to the bottom of the scandal, finally. Um, this would be kind of like running for president in 2012 and saying the national debt isn't a problem. It just fell radically afoul of the conventional wisdom. How big a deal was this? It was such a big deal that Evans and Novak devoted a column in June of 1974 to the proposition that Reagan was on the verge of destroying his political future. It began, to the dismay of his political handlers, Governor, Governor Ronald Reagan is no closer to a polite but clear break with President Nixon than he was a year ago and continues to resist that politically necessary rupture, even as he prepares to run for president. During a one-hour interview with us in his state capitol office, Reagan uttered not one discouraging word about Mr. Nixon. Now, by my reckoning, something important is going on here. Something that was opaque at the time, even to the people plotting his presidential campaign, who complained that Reagan was self-sacrificingly obsessed, quote, with offering Christian charity to a fallen political comrade. But let me unpack some other crucial lines in that column. The first is, 
Although the outspoken Reagan did not hesitate to snipe at the president during Mr. Nixon's first term, he has flinched from criticism since the Watergate scandal broke 14 months ago. The second is that Reagan has so far resisted this seems to be caused more by his own temperament than grand strategy. Um, I think it was because of his temperament, but it became a strategy. Evans and Novak uh, were wrong. I won't go into detail about my uh, biographical work on the sources of Ronald Reagan's political temperament, but consider this allegory. Ronald Reagan's older brother, Neil, uh, was an unsentimental man, a cynic. He remembers in an oral history uh, being sent to the butcher in Chicago on Saturday mornings with instructions to buy a 10 cent soup bone to last the week and also to ask for a complimentary chunk of liver for the cat. Here's the punchline. He said, we didn't have a cat. He told the historian with an understandable tincture of bitterness and shame that the liver was the family's big Sabbath meal. His brother tells a different story of his family's circumstances. Our main meal, he wrote in his post-presidential memoir in American Life, frequently consisted of a dish my mother called oatmeal meat. She'd cook a batch of oatmeal and mix it with hamburger. It was moist and meaty, the most wonderful thing I'd ever eaten. Now, it's kind of the argument of the invisible bridge that in the fullness of time, uh, a meaning for this allegory would be revealed. Uh, pundits presumed the country wanted politicians who shared self-pity about the terrible meal history was serving them. The politics of malaise, you may say. Of course, it turned out they preferred Ronald Reagan, bodying forth in the unshakable conviction that it was the most wonderful thing he'd ever eaten. And that the worse things got, the more forcefully and resourcefully he would figure out a way to reveal an underlying redemption underneath. In, in, in uh, his first memoir, he, he manages to turn the time he almost uh, died of um, tuberculosis into a happy story because he got tin soldiers and ends with this image of the sun streaming through the window. Um, Thus, in his first term, when, when, when Nixon was just an old regular president, he was available for Reagan's criticism. In his second, when he became the public symbol of all that was chaotic in a world that was falling apart, well, then Reagan became Reagan. He could not but be inexorably defended. The, there was a logic to everything Reagan said about Watergate, that Nixon was one of the good guys, a protector, that good guys are always innocent, and that even if it should happen that they somehow weren't, Watergate did not involve genuine crimes. And even if it did, it revealed nothing essential about the American character, which was a transcendent character simply by virtue of being American. It was just this sort of performance of blindness in the face of what other call, others called crisis that was fundamental to who Ronald Reagan was. This was, as computer programmers say, a feature, not a bug, in Reagan's political appeal. It was fundamental to why he made so many others feel good, which was fundamental to what he was be to become and how he changed the United States. Now, here's something I'll be arguing, not necessarily uh, entirely originally. Um, what was not fundamental to his appeal was the message that Reagan and Reaganites are most devoted to. The notion that the government was economic adversary to the middle class. History offered up a nice little natural experiment on that score in November of 1973. That year, some bad accounting and an improving economy had left the state of California with a nearly $1 billion fiscal surplus. Reagan's announced intention was to return the money to the taxpayers novel formulation for the time, by writing into the California Constitution a cap on both taxes and government spending. His, pro uh, his method was an unprecedented attempt by a sitting governor to sponsor a ballot initiative. He put it all out in the line politically. The architects included an economist named Milton Friedman and a gubernatorial chief of staff named Edwin Meese. Edwin Meese. Appropriate names because in every respect, Proposition 1 was a perfect template 
for a generation of conservative of movements, conservative movement appeals to follow. Here's how Reagan described it. Are we automatically destined to tax and spend, spend and tax indefinitely, until the people have nothing left of their earnings for themselves? Have we abandoned or forgotten the interests and well-being of the taxpayer whose toil makes government possible in the first place? Or is he to become a pawn in a deadly game of government monopoly whose only purpose is to serve the confiscatory appetites of runaway government spending? Now, the leader of the anti-proposition one forces, uh, Democratic Assembly Speaker Robert Moretti, uh, said he was in favor of lowering taxes, too. He said he was in favor of motherhood, too. <laughs> he just thought turning the state constitution into an iron corset was madness. He marshaled an array of statistics to demonstrate why Proposition 1 could not do what it was intended to do and was backed up by a nonpartisan uh, staffer in uh, Sacramento uh, who said that it, the numbers didn't add up. And um, Ronald Reagan went after this guy, much like conservatives go after the CBO now, as uh, actually biased and partisan. And that was a fascinating little discourse. It was the only time I've ever seen him uh, say anything bad about Watergate. He says it were, it's the, the, the statistics by this guy reminded him of Watergate. Um, he challenged, uh, Moretti challenged the governor to debate. Reagan refused him. Uh, Reagan explained Reagan was ducking him because in any tax limitation program that included, as Reagan's did, an expenditure ceiling, programs would have to be cut, and he knows he cannot answer the question we raised as to which programs he would cut. So he challenged the governor again and again, and Reagan refused him again and again. He was playing an entirely different game. When he made statistical claims, he blithely let them contradict each other. For instance, they said his plan would create deficits. He responded that it would produce $41.5 billion in new money. This is the first reference I'm aware of to the supply side claim that tax cuts uh, create revenue. Before um, the napkin was a gleam in, Alf, uh, in, uh, in Laffer's uh, eye. Um, he would state that the plan's uh, fundamental, uh, but then he would also state <laughs> that the plan's fundamental intention was to give the state less money to spend. His critics scratched their heads and unveiled more braces of statistics. To these, he would respond with moralistic perorations. When the advocates of bigger and bigger government managed to get their hands on an extra tax dollar or two, they quip, they hang on like a gila monster until they find some way to spend it, which, of course, didn't explain why there was a billion-dollar surplus. Um, but this was the rhetoric he used continuously when he was president, and it certainly didn't uh, hurt him in 1984 when he, went, uh, when he won uh, 49 states. On election eve, the Las Vegas odds maker Jimmy the Greek gave Proposition 1 a 3 to 1 chance of passage. Reagan's aide made ready, aides made ready for a national tour in which the governor would barnstorm the country selling the concept to other states to build bandwagon support for a presidential bid. Then came election day. Proposition 1 was crushed, 54 to 46%. One conservative state senator said that if the government used, governor used the same strategy to run for president, he'd be lucky to find a plane ticket to where the convention is. Now, you might say the ideological conditions uh, were not ripe. Uh, just how radically those uh, conditions have changed between then and now is suggested by an extraordinary editorial on Proposition 1 that appeared in the far-off uh, Milwaukee Journal, which uh, I read growing up and was a conservative paper. Entitled Voters Smarter Than Reagan, it argues that Californians admirably saw through the phoniness and recognized the menace to the well-being of the Commonwealth through the scheme. Now, check this out. They continued. The proposition had the surface appeal of the politician's favorite but false homily that says government should, quote, live within its income like everyone else. I think that Barack Obama said that uh, in, the, in the State of the Union uh, address. And then they went on to say what someone like Paul Krugman would say. Government is, in fact, not like everyone else, but uniquely different. It alone can and must be able to determine the level of its own income through the taxing power. To equate its financial situation with that of a private household is utter illogic. Now, in 1978, of course, California passed Proposition 13, which was also a tax limitation uh, initiative. Uh, 
But um, if you read an outstanding account like uh, Robert Kuttner's uh, The Revolt of the Haves, you know that that was a, a very different situation in which uh, through kind of the paradoxes of how California's uh, um, property assessments worked uh, was fundamentally unfair. Um, and uh, I think Kuttner pretty much demonstrates effectively that at least at the voting booth, the success had very little to do with people's uh, ideas about taxation or government themselves. It was about this tax and this circumstance. What did happen in 1978, though, was that conservatives quite effectively claimed Proposition 13 as a nationwide mandate for radical reduction of taxation and government. They did that, uh, of course, in 1980 also, and had lots of success passing budgets and laws that harmonized with that claim. Uh, if you go to rollingstone.com, my column uh, that just went up uh, this afternoon um, points out that Newt Gingrich did something very similar with the Contract with America. It was created by focus grouping pro voters, uh, said nothing about social conservatism, had as little conservatism as they could possibly manage and still get buy-in by all the Republican candidates. Uh, and then after they all won, it was claimed retroactively as a mandate for conservatism, much in the same way Bush uh, claimed his 2004 election as a mandate for privatizing Social Security, even though he hadn't mentioned on the campaign trail how um, Governor Walker in Wisconsin claimed his uh, victory in 2010 as a mandate for killing public employee unions. Uh, so this is a, a pattern. But here's a crucial point for, uh, for our political movement. Ronald Reagan did not get elected because he promised to dismantle big government in America just like Governor Walker didn't get elected because he promised to dismantle public unions. The statistics are compiled in the perennially useful 1986 study by Thomas, and, Thomas Ferguson and Joel Rogers' right turn, the decline of the Democrats and the future of American politics. One poll they cite asked voters in 1980 whether too much was being spent on environment, health, education, welfare, and urban aid programs, and only 21% thought so, the same percentage as in 1976, 1977, and 1978. The amount uh, saying the, that the money spent was either too little or about right was never lower in those years than 72%. The number favoring keeping taxes and services about where they are was the same as in 1975 and 1980, 45%. The pattern continues well into Reagan's presidency. In 1983, the Los Angeles Times found that only 5% of Americans thought regulations were too strict, while 42% called them not strong enough. Between 1978 and 1982, according to surveys from the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations, the number of voters who wished to expand rather than cut back not just social spending in general, but welfare programs increased by 26 percentage points. And finally, in 1984, when Reagan's approval rating was 68%, only 35% favored cuts in social programs to reduce the deficit, very similar to the kind of polling we see today. Now, of course, their president disagreed on the matter, and the voters knew this. 65% said they believed such cuts were imminent. And then 60% of them voted for Reagan instead of the Democrat Walter Mondale. Walter, Walter Mondale. Rogers and Ferguson call this policy alignment without electoral alignment. And uh, it presents a historical puzzle. Uh, how and why did it happen? Uh, some suggestions uh, will emerge in the Invisible Bridge, and a lot of them have to do with uh, changes in the Democratic Party, including uh, among uh, the Watergate babies elected from those Republican districts, uh, and um, I'm not going to go into them now, but I'm glad to talk about my theories later. Um, but what I'm prepared to argue now is that the Reagan movement arrived much less because of shifts in the ideology about the role of government, and much more about those sorts of stories Reagan told about American destiny. Like this one. Two months after the fall of Saigon, the greatest humiliation in American history, when Ronald Reagan, on his weekly radio show, described, quote, this is Reagan's word, a 20-foot craft adrift in the Gulf of Thailand with no food, no fuel, no water, barely afloat, and sinking with its cargo of 82 refugees. 
Towering over it was the aircraft carrier USS Midway. Once on board, they had one question. Would they be handed over to an unfriendly government, perhaps to eventually be murdered? The executive officer of the ship, ship told them this would not happen. He said, our job is to make you as comfortable as possible, heal the sick, and feed you to your heart's content. That was the official policy of our nation, and therefore, said Reagan, of the Midway. He describes uh, what I call a, a set of miracles, uh, uh, what did I say, uh, Miracles of the Loaves and Fishes straight out of the Gospel, according to Reader's Digest. A tiny baby with double ammonia was cured. This is Reagan speaking. People without clothes were given American clothing. Sailors took the old clothing and washed them for their gifts. Pretty soon, homeless children were given piggyback rides on the shoulders of American seamen, and Navy t-shirts bearing the midway decal began appearing on the little ones. Ads went into the ship's paper asking for toys. Charity begat more charity. There's a motto on the Midway. Midway puts it together. For the grateful refugees, that is the understatement of the year. In the dark days after World War II, when our industrial power and military might were all that stood between a war-ravaged world and a return to the Dark Ages, Pope Pius said, America has a genius for great and selfish deeds. Into the hands of America, God has placed the destiny of an afflicted mankind. I think those young men in the Midway have reassured God that he hasn't given us more of an assignment than we can handle. Now, the fact that the USS Midway also had another job <laughs> over the past 10 years, <laughs> I say, yeah, as a crucial launching pad for the death-dealing juggernaut that took the lives of millions of Vietnamese and also had not succeeded in winning the war, uh, could now be forgotten. Um, with Ronald Reagan, oatmeal meat could be transfigured into something palatable, even transcendent. The invisible bridge could be crossed. Thank you. And I'm going to um, sit down. Great. And uh, we'll, Rick will take questions. Uh, and, uh, How long do we have, Tom? Uh, we have about uh, half an hour. Oh. At most. Yeah. At most. <laughs> well, let's get a lively discussion going then. Yeah, I'll start. Um, uh, we were talking beforehand, and, and you said I should ask you about where social movements fit in. Uh, I'm not going to ask that question, but if you want to answer that question, I'd love to hear. Um, you, you talked about a lot about uh, Nixon and a little bit about Carter. I'm wondering where Gerald Ford fits into this story. Well, um, the ascendancy of Gerald Ford is straight out of my kind of original sort of set piece. Um, this is the guy who, um, well, I mean, I have a copy of my, uh, that Arab Nixon Link gave me a copy of the New York Times from August 9th, 1974. And every article is basically saying over and over again, the system worked, right? And uh, this was, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the New York Times once again calling a small and suspicious circles to lay down their arms. And uh, Gerald Ford, of course, that same day gives a speech in which he says, our long national nightmare is over. He was um, not only uh, framed himself and was framed by the media, at least originally, as a, a figure of reconciliation and unity, um, he was chosen in that way. Of course, a uh, member of Congress um, uh, who, uh, <laughs> Mike Royko has a hilarious riff about, um, about uh, Gerald Ford, that basically if you want to be president in 1974, uh, you basically have to go to Congress and accomplish nothing so you don't piss anyone off. <laughs> and you know, basically he just got reelected and reelected, you know, this is go along to get along guy. So that's what Gerald Ford was. And then he uh, introduced all this kind of uh, dramaturgy about buttering his own, uh, his own uh, egg muffin, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then um, he uh, thought this was all a mandate for uh, the, the first big decision he made a month later, which was to pardon uh, Richard Nixon. And in a way, it's, and I'm just kind of riffing this out for the first time, but it's a lot like what happened with kind of the attempt to, 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 to create a patriotic uh, 
ritual of reconciliation with the POWs. Suddenly Americans were at each other's uh, throats again. Well, actually, they were at Gerald Ford's throats. I mean, his uh, approval ratings went way down. And it was just seen as a rigged, dirty deal. Um, interestingly enough, the vast consensus of the American punditocracy was it was this wise binding up of the nation's wounds, and it would have been this terribly divisive thing to put Ronald Reagan on trial, which shows a lot, very little faith in American institutions, actually. Uh, and uh, the blogger Glenn Greenwald has argued that this is kind of was the opening inning of sort of the get out of jail free class, uh, get out of jail free card um, for America's uh, elites that leads through um, Iran-Contra and Bush and the NSA and torture and all the way through um, uh, the architects of uh, the subprime mortgage scandal. Um, so a couple things happen um, with Ford in the story. First of all, there's kind of a behind the scenes thing that goes on, uh, a, a battle between uh, one set of aides and another set of aides uh, over um, the doctrine of detente. And my methodology in this book is mainly kind of a certain kind of cultural history in which things kind of only show up in the book if they kind of show up in the public's radar. So I'm not going to go too much about this behind the scenes stuff, but it came out in things, for example, like um, when uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, author of the Gulag Archipelago, who really just heroically and brilliantly exposed the, the savagery of Stalin, uh, came to the United States, and Gerald Ford didn't want to risk detente by having him come to the White House, and that became a big public debate. Um, for the right, um, it's really interesting to see um, how many people, and kind of editorialists and stuff, uh, refer in like the years 1973 to 1974 to the end of the Cold War. Like people referred to it in 1989. So the Cold War really ended twice. Um, and in fact, George Kennan argues um, uh, that Reagan uh, prolonged the Cold War by um, reversing detente. Uh, that all the kind of collapses internal to Soviet society would have happened anyway, but hardliners gained more political power because of Reagan. So anyway, that's, that's an argument. But th this argument is going on, and of course the people fighting for the anti-detente side are Dick Cheney, Rumsfeld, James Schlesinger, uh, uh, these neoconservatives who would come back. Uh, and the other striking thing about that was that this um, anti-Ford, anti-detente, um, uh, and by the way, did, when, when Ronald Reagan said it's really a shame because of this Watergate thing because uh, Nixon has done such amazing things, he was specifically referring to detente. Um, it shows up in this fascinating 1976 Republican primary fight between Ford and Reagan. And uh, Reagan's not doing great. Once again, it fits the same pattern. He um, proposes this draconian across the board budget cut, which is just launched into uh, by pundits and is seen as profoundly discrediting. He does really poorly in New Hampshire. But then uh, Strom Thurmond, I mean, not Strom Thurmond, uh, Jesse Helms activates um, his uh, new nationwide, you know, uh, very much part of the conservative infrastructure that started with Goldwater and with Richard Vigory funding it and all the rest, he uh, mean to uh, launch Reagan in the North Carolina primary, which he wins on this issue of uh, the Panama Canal Treaty with this uh, very kind of draconian, Cold War, Manichaean, uh, America uh, is not going to um, give up, you know, uh, something that we built it, we paid for it, it's ours. It was one of these kind of bipartisan, um, it, liberals and kind of uh, technocrats are always being blindsided by right-wing populism, that rage they don't think coming. Even William F. Buckley supported this, but, you know, Reagan, you know, rides in on the white horse, and just to kind of finish up with a thought about Gerald Ford, he's kind of implicated in this logic too. I mean, there's this real tension between whether America can cease being this cowboy nation or not, because the year before that, when uh, this um, ship, the Mayaguez, this merchant ship, is that how you pronounce it, um, was uh, captured by um, 
in North Korea. Um, Ford, uh, at the instigation of Kissinger, orders a raid to rescue these guys. Hostages keep coming back in this story. Uh, and it's really a, it's just a clusterfuck, a disaster. More people are killed in the raid than, uh, more Americans are killed in the raid than are rescued. But it's still depicted in the press as this great heroic thing, and Ford says we you know, kick this Vietnam thing in the butt. Um, so lots of things are going on uh, with Ford. There's also, of course, Betty Ford, about whom I wrote a uh, lionizing a New York Times op-ed upon her death, um, arguing that she's more important as a historical figure than Gerald Ford uh, in uh, really sort of advancing a culture of disclosure and uh, um, de-shaming, I guess. Um, so, you know, lots of, lots of Ford, um, and he even, um, he even talked about running for, um, for uh, president again in 1980. So he'll be in there. <laughs> oh, and one more thing. I'm just kind of riffing on Ford, just kind of from various sources. This idea that Ford was this bumbling idiot who kept on falling downstairs, right? Um, I forget who points that out. It might be Sean Wilentz in his, his big book on this period. Uh, but this is a guy who was the best athlete as an American president, by far, this is a guy who, you know, skiing with all these Secret Service agents. He was a football star, and uh, really, he became the synecdoche for the bumbling nature of government itself. You know? I mean, people wanted to see him as a failure, just like a million different failures Reagan uh, made are somehow uh, covered up because people want to see. Uh, I have a riff about how um, 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 Barack Obama is never more Reaganite. And not in his ideology or his attitude towards government or the fact that he said government shouldn't do anything more than, than what we can't do by ourselves the other day. Um, he was never more Reaganite than when he said regarding the, whether he was going to investigate the Bush administration, Americans look forward, not backward. Yes? Could you say a little bit more about your take or at least your evolving take on, I think it's one of the most interesting things about this period, the, the evidence that the American public didn't seem all that conservative on a lot of governmental tax issues, regulation issues. But mixed into that is the whole new development of the new right with Richard Vickery, as you yeah. mentioned, and the split yeah. that some people write about of the the, um, the issues starting or the or the pol politics beginning to turn on the axis of cultural and social issues rather than economic and governmental kinds of issues. Yeah. So say a little bit more. It sounded like you were saying that yeah. the that the leadership yeah. on the right kind of led this before yeah. the public, but it feels more complicated. That's so yeah, I yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of ways into this, but one certainly involves people like Richard Vigory, who are really are conservative ideological entrepreneurs. And you know, what do they really care about in their heart of hearts? You know, I've interviewed. Richard Vigory three times, and I've seen the books that he has on his coffee table, and they're about public employee unions and, you know, uh, tax policy and um, things like that. Um, one can trace a, um, uh, a very deliberate strategy on the part of the people who became the new right, this organized, this interlocking set of institutions, um, uh, to uh, take advantage of uh, out pourings of cultural discontent whenever they, wherever they arise. In fact, Paul Weyrich says, we organize discontent. And the discontents were cultural. So, you know, I'll be narrating something that some folks might know in the textbook wars in West Virginia in 1974, in which um, these secular humanist textbooks uh, were uh, imposed by the school board on uh, good Christian families, and before long, people are uh, dynamiting the school board building. Well, lo and behold, who, uh, where the lawyer came from who defended these guys, the Heritage Foundation, this new group that not only sent this guy down to West Virginia to organize, but linked them up to nat a nationwide textbook movement. Um, Phyllis Schlafly, I mean, uh, her thing was not the ERA, it was foreign policy. You know, um, her, her, you know, 1964 book about how um, uh, Lyndon Johnson and Kennedy were disarming us was much more close to her heart. But it's very, you know, I mean, this is nothing new with me, but, you know, this was a very opportunistic thing on her part that she saw that basically the, 
ERA issue kind of sold. So, um, and then, as I, you know, um, let me a little Jeremiah in the middle there, uh, Republican uh, office holders uh, have been quite willing historically to claim a mandate for things that are, they don't actually have a mandate to do. That gets into another side of it, okay? When, this is when I'm talking about the, the changes in the Democratic Party. Um, uh, Democrats, liberals, have just been very good historically at being blindsided by these new forces. Um, it's no accident that, uh, and uh, I write about this in my Romney piece, um, about what really freaks politicians out uh, to, to, to get them to change their behavior. It's, it's losing. Look at the people who lost in 1980. Bill Clinton loses his reelection for governor. Joe Lieberman loses a congressional bid. Um, Birch Bayh uh, loses his Senate reelection, a great liberal. Who's the campaign manager? Evan Bayh, his son. All people who became tribunes of kind of the DLC tendency in the Democratic Party. Um, this sort of um, blindsiding leads to uh, uh, um, an exaggerated reaction on the part of Democrats who really get spooked by it and become scared of their own shadow. And you Republicans say you have a mandate? Okay. Look at Barack Obama the day after uh, the 2002 election, you know, in which he said, I get it. You know, I got a shellacking. You know, people want less government. He literally says this. I wrote a Newsweek piece in which I compared that to Ronald Reagan's press conferences, press conference the day after the election in 1982, in which he threw out his, his aides briefing paper saying, this is how you're going to say you, I get it. He did a Reagan thing. He just kind of spoke from the cuff. He said, oh, it wasn't that bad. We didn't lose that many seats. You know, historically, it's fine. Stay the course. Uh, the American people want what I'm, what I'm giving them. And um, um, you know, someone asked him, you know, was the, was the, was the, can you talk about the nastiness in the election we just experienced? Just, oh, it was all the Democrats' fault. You know, we're talking about two different political cultures here. We just uh, look at the, the 2008 election. Everybody who does, you know, standard political sciences science would say, okay, the Republicans will now move to the middle, they'll be more moderate. They've taken exactly yeah. the opposite. Well, you know, what comes from listening to political scientists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 my, 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 any, 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 uh, well, you know, like, you know, there's this political science journal, uh, uh, PS, colon, political science and politics, which would be like, any, there's no journal called H, history and history, you know, it's just kind of, the idea that poli politics would be the subject of political scientists has to be sort of, uh, has to be announced. Um, so, um, no, I, I, I find a lot of political science extremely valuable. But um, the, um, the other piece of it um, is, and this is work that's being done by a lot of really good historians all over the place, mostly younger ones, is you know, just the rise of, um, uh, well, um, uh, um, I think Judith Stein calls it the trade unionism of the ruling class. You know, that, that corporations begin to politicize in unprecedented ways, responding to the squeeze in profits, uh, responding to um, uh, um, the fact that um, uh, uh, commodities are controlled by these third world countries that are nationalizing left and right. Um, and uh, that history is kind of becoming familiar. But, you know, that has, you know, and does, the, they make an investment in um, politicians, you know. Um, so there's, you know, lots of lots of things uh, going on, and of course, also people love the idea of um, uh, supporting government subsidies they get, and uh, despising the ones that go to Untermenschen. Uh, and uh, there's also um, there's also uh, the fact that there is this profound distrust of institutions, which extend to government institutions. Um, you know, I mean, I, I collect kind of examples of um, liberals saying government doesn't work. And they're saying it out of a liberalism, by, of, and for liberalism. But nonetheless, it ends up empowering the person who told the most convincing story uh, about government as a failure as such, and that was Ronald Reagan. So like, you know, like, 
the, the Mike Royko um, uh, column comes from this collection of his. Uh, I'm from Chicago. I grew up, uh, I'm not from Chicago. I live in Chicago, but I went to college in Chicago, and I you know, was a big Mike Royko fan. And he has this, uh, the collection it came out of, like half the columns are, here's what these idiot government bureaucrats are doing today. You know? So it became easy uh, to, um, to uh, get far discrediting government. And you also have people like William Proxbier. You, you get Democratic, also by foreign of liberalism, becoming these very aggressive budget hawks. The Golden Fleece Award. So he was this Wisconsin senator who every month would give out a award to the most wasteful government spending, which invariably was some like basic research thing, you know, that sounded hilarious a, as a headline, but you know, was actually, you know, doing things that uh, might have uh, helped our trade deficit, <laughs> you know, circa 2012. The political scientist. I'm actually not a political scientist. Ah. I misunderstood your quote. I am a strange creature in the room that I'm not an American historian, but rather a historian of foreign relations coming from it from the other side, which is the Soviet Union. And that's yeah. the question I wanted to ask. Is it seems to me that when you describe Reagan, you see him winning on foreign policy almost in New Hampshire and by making these anti detente statements. Yeah. But what I find fascinating is he's playing it against anxieties that exist globally. Yeah. There's a, there is a second Cold War that starts in the late 70s, but and previously that people think the Cold War is over. So I was wondering if you can kind of riff on what happens to the American kind of American culture as the Cold War does seem to at the time abate, because if you read the sources from the period, the people from the Central Committee to the New York Times are saying there's no Cold War anymore. Yeah. Um, well, of course, then we introduce the other guy, Carter, right? And um, in a sense, you know, I mean, I think political science will tell you elections don't really turn on uh, foreign policy unless the foreign policy is really domestic policy, I would say, you know, and become part of this, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, dominant meta narrative of American decline, American destiny. Uh, you have um, Jimmy Carter trying to run this kind of uh, technocratic foreign policy, uh, um, this kind of complex negotiation he's doing with um, uh, um, uh, this idea of human rights as a driving force in, in foreign policy, except when it comes to Iran, who's the first, you know, like the Shah is the first guy who, you know, like uh, he gives a state dinner to and says wonderful, nice things about him. Um, so he's, you know, runs up against pretty powerful structural constraints. Uh, and then, of course, um, he has, um, well, I don't want to say um, the terrible luck. I mean, David Farber isn't here, but um, he runs against the Iran hostage situation. And Jimmy Carter was the guy who decided to make this the central narrative of what was happening in America. I mean, he uh, made a huge deal out of it. Um, so, you know, he made some very bad misjudgments. And... Um, the Soviet Union, um, I think from their side, right, they didn't think that we would go berserk at Afghanistan, right? Um, the research is they actually, the narrative from the Soviet side and from the diplomatic history side is that Carter starts the Second World War, really, and the Soviet Union only goes into Afghanistan because they fear that Carter is going to beat them there. Right, which is different from, oh my God, Soviet powers on March. Yeah, because which they is, assume the loss of Iran is going to force us there. Yeah, and there's Angola, you know, it's like there's this kind of reigniting of kind of Cold War. It's almost like it's, it's, it's in America's comfort zone. Like we couldn't kind of handle, you know, uh, you know the idea of, um, you know, um, realistic balance of power or an idealistic foreign policy. I mean, it seems like the public is more comfortable with a, um, a Reaganite story about America's place in the world and, and uh, you know, USS Midway, you know, uh, saving the world. And, um, you know, I was just reading um, Robert Perry, the great foreign policy investigative journalist, wrote a piece uh, on his consortium news about what Reaganism did to Guatemala, you know, and uh, basically the genocide of Indian villages there. And, it's just not part of American discourse. That's one example on kind of the, 
big resonance of the project is, you know, we're all Reaganites now, and that we just kind of um, don't really, um, we uh, aren't comfortable with um, fundamental structural critiques of American institutions. And, you know, I think that in um, sort of the biggest kind of 30,000 feet optic, I mean, it's why we have such a hard time coming to grips with something like the financial crisis, you know? I mean, um, we're just too trusting of institutions. And uh, the idea, you know, it's like the American people. We can't handle the truth, right? And, but we were kind of getting there, you know? If you look at, you know, um, Watergate and the church committee and, you know, the fact that when Jimmy Carter went before the American people in 1979 and said we're suffering a crisis of confidence, and we really need to uh, think about um, uh, scarcity and the limits of American aspirations. That actually was a popular speech, as a new piece of scholarship uh, demonstrates. Um, but he managed to blow that too. I mean, that's, given what you just said, I was thinking about even the Occupy Wall Street movement. I mean, I don't know that I would put it that the American public can't handle the truth. Is that the media and political elite environment backs off from taking a chance on that a lot of times. You know, well, we were having a, a discussion about, uh, at, at lunch, me and Tom and David Farber, about um, shifts in the media during this period. And what you see coming out of the 60s is um, what now is obvious in retrospect was this narrow window in which uh, these uh, organs of elite American opinion through television and, and newspapers, but especially television, I think, uh, commanded this moral authority and this sort of kind of interdirected confidence to, 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 to distinguish right from wrong. Uh, and um, a lot of that had to do with, um, you know, just getting through here we are at the Annenberg School and the media history of it was, um, according to Godfrey Hodgson, a lot of it had to do with um, the network's trying to rehabilitate their reputation after the quiz show scandals, building up their news divisions as loss leaders, as basically uh, um, huge divisions indifferent to uh, whether they made money or not. And uh, you begin to see that falling apart in the 70s. Um, and um, but also there's a paradox because what you're talking about is the democratization of American culture, you know, and a more populist take on what America is and should be, you know. People are willing to lecture their betters who are telling them that they should, um, um, they should um, look at America with a more jaundiced eye. And uh, that certainly um, plays into Reagan and Reaganism. I have a question about um, the framework, the bridge that you're building to the uh, 1980s. Uh, uh, your story hinges on Reagan and Reagan's uh, oatmeal meat, uh, and on uh, the part that you didn't elaborate on too much, but it's, it's clearly a central part of the way that a lot of folks think about the 1970s, the internal problems of the Democratic Party and the tensions and contradictions within liberalism. But I'm wondering about the Republican Party and what's happening within the Republican Party in the critical period that you're writing about. They're really from Watergate. Really? Uh, uh, Ford is, uh, um, you know, got some pretty serious liabilities. On the other hand, Reagan loses. The, the, the loser of 73 and 74 uh, continues to lose in 75 and 76. Yet, internally, between 1976 and 1980, the Ford wing is atrophying. Um, yeah. really quickly, uh, yeah. and uh, um, the Reagan version uh, of, of, uh, of, of Republican identity really seems to be um, supplanting it. So what's happening in that critical, what's happening in that critical window internally to the yeah. Republican Party itself that is laying the groundwork for yeah. uh, maybe building the foundations of that bridge? Uh, well, one of the things is, you know, kind of much like, um, well, no. So the Republican Party was like seen as, and I guess was really, really, really weak. I mean, I, I think it's in my notes somewhere, but in 1975, I think they ran like a half an hour commercial. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
it was um, called like Republicans are people too. <laughs> and like, you know, like after Watergate, like, you know, like 15% uh, of the public was identifying themselves as Republican. Then you had this like resounding Democratic victory in 1974. And, um, uh, you know, their coffers are bare. And um, I think, I think this book came out in 76 or maybe even 77. Some great political scientist whose name is escaping me writes, you know, the death of the Republican Party or something like that. Um, famous last words, right? Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, internally, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm always in favor of studying off year elections because they're the most interesting in kind of leading indicators. So, 74 is interesting because um, it was this false dawn for the Democrats, right? And uh, they presume that they can, you know, like, that what the public wants is, you know, reform of the congressional committee system, right? And if you look at um, something like um, um, so, uh, a really good, you know, like, um, what's, what's his name? The, the guy who writes the, the history of um, Congress at Princeton. Um, yeah, Zellerzer's book. I mean, um, the Republicans just, you know, completely are able to take advantage of this decentralization of Congress to become more powerful in Congress. Um, you have the conservative movement expending lots of energy in a way that isn't directly uh, Republican, but ends up benefiting the Republican Party. Following, during this period of incredible Republican weakness, people like Will Vigory and William Rush are discussing a third conservative party, running Reagan, Reagan and George Wallace in 1976. But then, so 1978 um, is a pretty strong Republican year. Um, and it includes things like um, uh, primary challenges in which conservatives beat liberals, like uh, this guy named Jeffrey Bell beats Clifford Case, this legendary Republican. So you begin to see more of the ideological uh, realignment. And um, the fact turns out um, that um, much like the Republicans weren't nearly as weak as they appeared in 1964, and we were able to come back as early as 1966 on, in, you know, Nixon lands argument, um, sort of, uh, race issues basically. Um, by 1978, um, you have the ERA. You know, you have um, all these uh, social issues. Um, I'm not super familiar with the internal dynamics of this. I'm, that's something I should pick up a monograph on this. I don't know who the RNC chair was in 19. 78, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's somewhere I need to do a little work. Does anyone, does anyone know of any, uh, any books on the subject? <laughs> Leads to the question I wanted to ask you, which is, uh, you were talking before about um, sort of this disconnect right, between like the policy items that people like that Americans actually want and the kind of narrative well, about line, the market. Policy without political reasons. Yeah. Um, and so actually that's something that the Republicans in the 70s are really acutely aware of. Uh, so I just came back from spending two weeks reading Barbara Teeter's papers at Ford Library where he's really, really worried about all of these middle of the road people that the Republicans don't know what to do with and he's citing all these numbers from the Republicans' own polling about you know, the majority of Americans support abortion rights, support ERA, that being pro-life is hurting Ronald Reagan, that you know, he's like very, very worried about conservatism overtaking the GOP's chances of yeah. getting anywhere. And it seems like that those numbers, not on the social issues necessarily, but but even there, not as not so bad. Like they stayed pretty, and certainly on the economic ones, other policy issues, they stayed really solid. You know, not really with the GOP yeah. throughout this whole period. I mean, up to even up to the present, and yet there's still not just a rhetorical shift at the level of like pundits and things, but also a shift in terms of sort of the political common sense, right? That even if you ask people specific questions about which programs they want to cut and stuff, they still don't want to cut anything, but. If you just get people to talk in generalities, now everything is about markets and you know the evils of government. And even in the early 70s, that would not have been the case. And, and well, I yeah. wonder what you think. I mean, I think this about. is this is kind of the time to make a commercial for the you know, graduate students and, and scholars that you know 
biography matters. And uh, we have a quote unquote great man, you know, who by force of charisma is able to square these circles, you know, and uh, get people to vote, get, not only get people to vote for the Republicans, but get used to voting for the Republicans, get uh, used to uh, splitting their tickets and voting for a Republican presidential candidate. Um, because of the force of his rhetoric and his uh, personality, I guess you'd say. Um, and of course, there are structural changes going on. Elections are becoming much more candidate-centered, media-centered, parties are becoming weaker. This is pretty familiar. This is, I guess, what you're, the kind of stuff you're working on, right? And um, you know, so you get like, you know, like a figure like uh, Gary Hart, who's this young, handsome guy, who um, says we're not a bunch of little Hubert Humphreys when he wins the Senate race in 1974, in which he wins in a primary against basically the George Meany of Colorado, you know? So um, uh, maybe some of this has to do with um, more telegenic candidates, you know? We have time for one more question for this one. Yeah. I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more, and maybe briefly, but you know, about the implications going forward of you know, the emphasis um, you know, on this American destiny idea that, that you're really pushing. And I think obviously it's coming out of, I mean, we see it coming out of Vietnam and you know, the oil crisis and energy crisis and so on, and you're really moving into to Central America much more forcefully. We didn't, I mean, I know this is you know, the 80s, not the 70s, but you know, the implications of the focus you know, going forward during Reagan's terms, if there are you know, additional ways or places in you know, Central America, certainly being one of the other ways that this really plays out in meaningful. Well, I mean, America, you know, I'm not a strategic studies guy by any means, but America has a really weakened strategic posture. You know, in October of 1973, there's nothing we can do about you know, the oil embargo, and OPEC knows it, and that's why they're playing with us. You know, and uh, there's nothing we can do about you know uh, Vietnam invading Cambodia or da da da. da. So um, um, I think you know what Reagan as president is trying to do, and what the neocons are trying to do with things like Team B is kind of you know rearm America. You know, and and um, defense budgets skyrocket. There is no price ceiling on American security. That was the line. And um, I, then you get into interesting territory because Reagan does turn out to be an interesting figure when it comes to things like negotiations with the Soviets and the fact that he, you know, uh, spilled very little blood as president, and you know, um, you know, uh, uh, well, other people spilled blood, you know, uh, with us looking the other way, yes, but you know, for example, doesn't do anything about Beirut, you know, and and. <laughs> You know, imagine if the Democrat was president and, you know, like 300 Marines were tortured, you know. Uh, except for, you know, like, go into Grenada, you know. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting, you know. And, and I think this, um, uh, Robert Mann's book on Reagan, uh, and also uh, a more kind of popular book called Tear Down This Myth, which, you know, writes about uh, Reagan, the peacemaker. Um, you know, like everything, the, everything Reagan did that was popular was liberal. Yeah. Um, uh, and the conservative movement excoriated at the time. I mean, you should read George Will on, on, on Ronald Reagan, round about you know, 1987, for you know, daring to, to talk about, uh, talk, to talk to Gorbachev. I mean, the reason he gave this speech, tear down this wall, was to shut people like George Will up, because he was doing the opposite. <laughs> uh, so that's just kind of an interesting, complicated question. Still live in the shadow of Reagan, uh, as has been evidenced uh, uh, by Scott Walker and, and the uh, uses of Reagan by opponents of, of Walker and, and supporters of public employee unions trotting out uh, quotes from Reagan about, about unionism. We have you know, candidates now wrapping themselves in the mantle of Reagan and the Republican Party for whom Reagan might be too liberal today. Uh, and uh, so Rick's uh, talk, I think, gives us really essential background in thinking about the current. Uh, political situation today, and uh, um, having read both of his previous books and many of his essays, um, I, I think, like you, I am eagerly waiting uh, to cross the invisible bridge. Uh, <laughs> Me <you>. too. <laughs> Thank you.